for our next presentation, we will listen to Bjorn Borg, and I'm standing here with CFO and CEO. Welcome. Thank you, Elmer. It's fantastic to be back again. We love hanging out here. So I guess I just fire away, guys, because you can't wait, uh, and neither can I. So uh, I think it's pretty clear for everyone that the world is changing at a dramatic pace. And of course, last year we were hit by this massive pandemic, and you know a number of things, of course, uh, you know, sort of sped up due to that. So predominantly, I think this whole digital transformation that was going on, of course, also prior to the pandemic, really, you know, went on fire. Uh, so it's clear that that has a massive impact on the distribution landscape. And I think the theme of the day is to talk about e-commerce. And uh, just looking at um, 2020, so looking back a bit, um, everyone, of course, projected that e com will continue to grow. Uh, what happened last year, of course, that it really, you know, ended up being a massive growth, you know, plus 40% looking now at Sweden. This is numbers from Handens Utrens Institute. So they talk about e com doing, you know, a, a one-year jump that potentially would have taken three, four years without the pandemic. So we saw a big, big swift and a big change uh, during 2020. And of course, also that has a massive impact on the different categories. So what we see here is the share of e-com business from different categories. So looking at, for example, you know, clothing and footwear, in 2019, the share of business coming from e-com was 20%. Closing 2021, it's 30%. So, of course, the shift is just going super, super quick because, of course, we all know that it's not an underlaying growth um, that is, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 percent. So, of course, taking massive, massive volumes away from brick and mortar. And that, of course, happened also prior to the pandemic, but it really sort of went on fire during last year. And, of course, the billion dollar question is, will that continue? And, of course, I think we are pretty clear that Without any doubt, you know, 2021 has also been a year where e-commerce is growing at a much, much quicker pace than brick and mortar. So what you see here is coming from Sven Thunder's 2021 annual report. And year to date, we see a 16% increase in e-com. Um, and you know, home electronics plus 18, you know, furniture you know, up 21. So of course, you know, a much, much quicker growth here than the category in general. So of course, indicating that the shift is continuing. Perhaps not, of course, at the same pace. Uh, remember, 40% growth the year before, now, now 16, but still, of course, growing versus very, very strong year-on-year -year numbers. So clearly, e-commerce is here to stay, and it's clearly on a very, very good growth run as well. And what we also see, of course, you know, is that consumer behavior is changing. So looking at 2021 and 2020, and these are numbers from uh, PostNode, and they're a barometer that they did just a, a few a few weeks ago, I think. And uh, for example, you know, um, last year, you know, 24% was rating speed as uh, as one of something that they really really appreciated. You know, that has went down a bit, and instead, of course, they're now asking for flexibility. And of course, I think you know, looking at how we're now living our life, you know, perhaps we're working more from the office right now, so flexibility might be a bit better or more important than than being quick. But what we've sort of taken out of this is it's clear that you know, with this e-commerce world. Things are going very, very quick. It's not so much about being big, but rather about acting really quick to consumer changing behaviors. And, and we see that sort of ongoing changing almost like week to week. So it's a, a very different way of doing business versus you know, our traditional sort of wholesale brick and mortar business, which was just much, much more slower. So um, that's one sort of key takeaway that we've uh, took with us. Um, looking into the future, of course, you know, very hard. Uh, I think if the pandemic taught us one thing, it's almost close to impossible to, you know, guess what tomorrow will bring. Uh, but one thing is clear, uh, Svensk Skandel, and I think we also subscribe to their future outlook, uh, is that um, looking at 2019, as you can see here, we had 164,400 people employed in in-store-based retail in Sweden. Um, looking at their forecast for 2030, that will be 72,000. Uh, looking at employed in Swedish-based e-commerce was 18,000, and they anticipate that to be 56,000. And of course, looking at the number of retail stores from 22,819 down to 12,000 in 2013. So of course, we, we don't really know, of course, but I think it's very, very clear that the, the shift you know, towards you know, online business, e-commerce is going to continue. And of course, the big payer will be those driving you know, retail store formats, brick and mortar formats, because clearly there will be no more growth there. That's very, very clear. You know, however, of course, the winner in all this is going to be the end consumer. 
So of course, you know, the key takeaway for us is that you need to be staying even closer to the consumer if you want to win in this you know, very quick, fast pacing, changing landscape. So uh, looking at um, the growth numbers then, so I think for us it's clear, and that was also already the case, I think, you know, one year or two years ago, that all the growth uh, that we expect from sports and fashion in general, so not only talking about Bjorn and Boy, will only come through e-commerce. There's no more growth you know, coming from brick and mortars in, in, in Europe anymore. That's, that's all done. And here's just a couple of numbers. So, you know, Swedish e-commerce, so 108, you know, a billion Swedish kroner is expected to be 289. And then store-based retail going from 364 down to 326. So again, who knows, but very, very clearly, you know, most people, and we certainly subscribe to that, are anticipating an ongoing strong e-commerce growth going forward which, of course, will challenge the brick-and-mortar format, enabling them to change, of course, and adapt to this new reality. Because what we're seeing is that the need for a store format is not going to go away completely, but, but certainly you know, the role that that will play is going to be very, very different depending on how you want to approach the market. So for us, I think this is all good news, because already you know, four years ago, we said that we need to transform this brand in two aspects. So one, we need to reposition the brand from being only colorful men's underwear into becoming a sports fashion brand. And of course, we see that that was a, a very strong decision and very right, because of course, the increased trend around health and well-being and training is really, really booming. So I think that was a good shift. And of course, we continue to capitalize on that trend. The second one, of course, is the transformation. So away from you know, fiscal retail, uh, physical samples into a much more digital world. So everything from how we sell the products, but also how we create the products in terms of virtual sampling and so on. But very clearly, this idea of attacking the online world that we took a few years ago is really playing out really, really well. So of course, you know, looking at what remains the same though, so independently on whether you want to drive you know, store-based retail or whether we want to be online, I think one key sort of clear takeaway for us is that if you own your brand, that's very, very good. Uh, if you only own distribution, well, you know, if you're lucky, you are in where the distribution is working. And if you're not so lucky, then you're stuck with thousands of stores. And that's going to be very hard to get out of. However, of course, we have the strength of owning our own brand. And with that, of course, our biggest challenge is to make sure that we are where the consumers are. And of course, currently, that is in, in, in various different you know, e-com platforms. Uh, what remains the same, though, is our ambition to build the number one sports fashion brand for people that want to feel active and attractive. That doesn't change just because the distribution is changing. And of course, it's also clear that you, know, you can't spend enough money nor enough time making sure that the team that you have working for you, those are the enablers. You know, those are the ones that needs to make all this happen. So, of course, that doesn't really matter either whether you're focusing on e-commerce or brick-and-mortar stores. So, of course, we have, during the last seven years, you know, heavily invested into our own team with the idea of building the best workplace in universe. And I know a few people laugh when I say that, but that's really the idea. You know, of course, of course I think we concluded a long time ago, it's really only two things that, you know, makes us unique. And, uh, and one of them is that Jens, my CFO, has made up his mind to be at Bjorn Boy, so he can't be anywhere else. So that's one thing, because there's only one Jens in the world. And the second one is our brand. There's only one Bjorn Boy brand. But that's it. You know, everything else, everyone else has as well. They also sell black t-shirts and underwear, and they have stores or no stores. But what really makes us unique is us and the brand. And that's what we need to sort of really, really invest. So a high focus in creating a very strong team culture, making sure that we attract, of course, you know, the right people. Um, and of course, the, the capabilities are changing very quickly. So of course, what we're looking for right now is slightly different from what we looked you know, for three, four, five years ago. But of course, constantly refueling the organization with the right people and creating an environment that really makes people want to work for us. That's you know, super, super important. And of course, you know, I've been talking a lot about ourselves. And if you do that, there won't be a second date. We, we all know that. And um, our approach really that we kicked off you know, in 2020 and 2021 has been to reshift our focus in terms of communication also online. And here's just a couple of numbers in terms of what consumers says when it comes to you know, social media, where they get their input, you know, who, who they listen to. And I think one clear takeaway is that 92% of all the consumers trust recommendations from individuals over brands. And that has changed dramatically. 
So there's simply you know, no point as a brand to do massive above-the-line campaigns and telling a story that you've manufactured yourself. We believe that the key to reaching out to end consumers is to reshape that message and have other people telling it for you. And of course, you know, funny enough, you know, Sweden, together with Germany, a bit in the UK, turned out to be leading in creating D2C brands that are focusing only on ambassadors and influencers building their story. And that has been working tremendously well. So of course, we are in a luxury position where we have a lot of perhaps competitors, what do I know, that is working directly to consumers, focusing on apparel as well, and is really showcasing the massive opportunities it is by working with others, having other people telling your story. And we're doing that as well. So of course, the whole idea is then to have a bunch of ambassadors or friends, you know, call it whatever you want, that is really a part of the Bjorn Boy family and enabling them to tell their story about our brand, using our products, recommending the stuff that they like, giving us feedback on the stuff that they don't like, and using them, of course, and together and create a very, very strong community. And we can see that is working exceptionally well. So it's a bit of a blurry slide, but um, every week we're asking consumers in all of our markets uh, a bunch of different questions just to make sure that we you know, get traction for the money that we're spending. And what we see here is purchase intent. Uh, so what, what have you planned to purchase? And um, uh, it's hard to see, but we're the red line here. And we have a positive trend, increasing year-to-date, plus 26%. And currently, of course, if we ask consumers, we're number four. So it's only Nike, Adidas, and Puma that is ahead of us. So we are actually ahead of some of the other very quick-moving you know, D2C brands. And of course, that's because we managed to create a strong brand mission with the whole idea of train to live. But also, of course, we managed to tie in you know, very strong influencers and ambassadors that is helping us to, to tell that message. So that's working you know, exceptionally well for us. So I think um, uh, with that said, of course, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, running you know, e-commerce and, and e-trade you know, puts a different pressure into the organization. You, know, you need to do different things. You need to have a different mindset, but also, of course, you need to be much, much quicker. And actually, it comes down to really spending time understanding and knowing the consumer and also having the courage to test. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny, but... Uh, almost always, at least you know, when I'm trying to guess which newsletter or you know, which ad is working the best, I'm always guessing wrong. So the simplest no, you know, shortcut here, you need to do a lot of A-B testing constantly. And when you do that, you see there's just a dramatic change by just swapping a few things. So I just took you know, one of our latest examples around our you know, paddle collection that is working exceptionally well that we just rolled out just a few weeks ago, just you know, capitalizing on this fantastic paddle trend. But uh, on the left here, you know, we have newsletter A, um, very, very nice, you know, exactly the same text, you know, nice model, you know, all, all looks super, super fine. I thought this was fantastic. And then we did a newsletter B. Of course, here we had a, a, you know, a bit more focus, you know, closer pictures. And, and of course, what we saw is that the, 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 the click went up to 6.6%. And actually, this one here is delivering an upside on sale on 6% versus, you know, version A. So, of course, it doesn't take longer to create newsletter B than newsletter A. But, of course, this is going to you know, drive a completely different you know, p and and value to the, to the organization. So, of course, uh, in the past, you know, we were much slower. You, know, you sold in something, and then you knew you know, quite late whether it worked or not. Currently, you know, we can test if it's working before we even you know, know it's working. So, of course, that's the beauty of e-commerce. But, of course, it means that you need to reshift the whole organization towards understanding this, staying much, much close to the consumer and having the courage to test stuff that you think that, well, that's never going to work. And then all of a sudden you realize that, well, it did work. Okay, let's do more of that. And, of course, learn as you go along. But it's changing you know, quickly. So even though newsletter B worked last week, it's not sure that's going to work next week, actually. So this is a fast-changing environment. That's very, very clear. So uh, I think with that said, of course, um, I'll hand over to Jens to talk more about, okay, how does it look then in terms of numbers? You know, how is this online attack evolving in terms of our overall share of the business? So uh, I think with that said, you know, Jens, our CFO, you know, fire away and, um, and show some numbers. Yes, will do. Thank you, uh, Henrik. Um, so before I do that, I just want to um, say that I am certainly happy to be here. I'm unique. I'm here, and I'm very happy to uh, to be here uh, in the best place in the universe. Um, we're, we're soon there. Um, that said, so um, we we just heard uh, how how online and the digitalization is speeding up, and and to break that down to a few numbers. 
for, for us. What we're looking at here is what we call online sales at Bjorn Boy. Um, and what we call for that is our own e-commerce, which is uh, at the bottom here, our own website. We group that into e-tailers, so the pure online players in the wholesale channels. And then we also have uh, what we call marketplace, that would be Amazon, etc., Ball.com in the Netherlands. And what we can clearly see, uh, this is the quarter two back uh, a few years back. And we can see that we were had a share of total sales being online of around below 20, around 20 percent of our total revenue. Something happened clearly during 2020 when the pandemic uh, hit us, uh, more than doubling our online sales. So we can see that our own e-commerce went from around 9 million, 10 million up to 22 in the quarter two. Uh, the e-tailers from 15 or so up to uh, about 30, close to 40 million. And, and totally the share then also doubled. So 38% uh, 80, <clears throat> in the quarter two of 2021 versus 19 back in 2017. So a massive change and it's growing really, really quick. And you just heard Henrik talk about it from a more global perspective, perhaps, but that's also to be seen in our numbers at Pion Boy. So we will release the Q3 report uh, in a few weeks and we will tell you more about it, of course. Uh, but clearly there's no signs from anywhere that this trend uh, would, would stop. Um, if we then look at some um, you know, hard numbers in terms of our own e-commerce. So this is our uh, P&L, you could say in a graph uh, a variant, um, for own e-commerce, own website sales of uh, full year 2017 to 2020. Uh, and the blue bars is representing then the sales. And again, we can see we're almost doubling the sales from 2017 to 2020. So own e-commerce is growing 100%, really, really quick. But the impressive part, I would say, is that the profitability, so the EBIT, is increasing even more. We, we, we made a loss on our own e-commerce back in the days, in 2017, also in 2018, actually. Now we have a 23% profit margin in own e-commerce. And that's coming then, of course, from... The margins, which is the gray line here, uh, being really, really high. So the gross margins stable around 74, 75%. At the same time, our operating expenses, so the cost of running the business, is decreasing. So, you know, we, we have the amount of operating expenses that we kind of need to run the business. And as sales grow, margins intact, well, clearly the profitability will increase. So, so obviously a massive improvement uh, in terms of all aspects, really, uh, when it comes to our own e-commerce. So <clears throat> if we focus uh, on the Q2 again, um, um, we saw versus, um, uh, versus the quarter two of 2020, as well as quarter two 2019, 15% uh, growth versus 2020, rather modest, but we focused in, in 2020 on keeping the profitability as high as we possibly could, not knowing really what's happening. Uh, but however, versus 2019, so before the pandemic, we're increasing more than 100% in the quarter alone. Uh, let's not focus so much on the other channels. I just wanted to highlight our own e-commerce since that's the, the theme of the day. Uh, if we break down own e-commerce again, but our own our markets. So we sell e-commerce around 50, 60 markets. Uh, clearly, small numbers in the outer markets. The, the main, the majority of our sales is in our home and core markets that uh, I've listed here. So Sweden, Benelux, Germany, etc. And um, the top line is representing the uh, growth versus Q2 2020 and the bottom line Q2 2019. And again, the uh, more than doubling versus 2019, as I just show you on the other slide, you can see a bit more split. So it's three, uh, over 100% in most of our mature markets. Versus 2020, a bit less, as I said, since we focused very much on profitability during 2020, to, to, since we did not really know what the future had uh, ahead of us. 
We can see a decline of 44% in the UK. UK used to be our third biggest markets on e-commerce. Uh, there was a decline of 44% versus 2020, coming from, from really from the Brexit and everything that came along with that. So we noticed that the delivery uh, distribution patterns and uh, partners that we used could really not handle the Brexit. No one really knew what was going on. And the products were stuck in customs and it cost quite a lot. So it took us very long time to deliver our products to the end consumers. And clearly, if you're an end consumer buying something and it takes weeks to get it, well, you will only buy once. Now we have addressed that, we have changed partner and we have reduced the lead times a lot and also the cost, in fact, so that we, I expect that to, to, um, to go back to growth. But this is a, a massive growth versus 2019 that we can see in our numbers following what Henrik just said on, on the global trends. Um, so I will try to summarize uh, a little bit of what we have just um, been talking about here today. Um, so it's quite clear that you need to be where the consumers are. Uh, we will continue with our high online focus. We have that in three different buckets, if you want. Our own e-commerce website that I just talked about, growing like crazy. The uh, e-tailers, which is online players in the wholesale channels. They certainly have a part to doing the pandemic in terms of financial increases and growth. Uh, and we want to be there. We're growing very, very quick with them. Um, and then we have marketplaces that we also focus on, majority of this being uh, Amazon as well as Bold.com, as I mentioned before, in the Netherlands. That's where our focus will be going forward. In terms of communication, um, so we will continue, obviously, to, to, tra to transform the brand um, into sports. We commun communicate around sports. We have a theme that you hopefully have seen, it's called Train to Live. That's what we do. We don't live to train. We don't want to be the fastest on 100 meter. We don't want to lift most in bench press or whatever it's called. We just want to train to become a little bit better. I mean, it's quite clear that we live from within. We, we do what we say. We train a lot. And we do that not to be fast, actually. We just do that because we want to. Well, me, I do it. I want to be a better father. That's what I do. And everyone has their own reasons, but we train to live. We know that if you move, you eat well, you sleep well, and you spend time with the people you love, you will be a little, little bit better tomorrow than what you are today. And we certainly believe in that. And we will continue to communicate around the train to live concept. All the communication, more or less, will be online. That's where we spend our money. That's the investments that we do. Everything is online focused. Right, in terms of profitability, well, that's the key word, actually. We will continue to drive profitable growth. We're just now internally talking about the budget for next year, and certainly it will be on profitability. We will put all our money on profitable growth. We don't want to grow with partners that are not into the same thinking that we are. Uh, well, there's a win-win situation, as in everything else that you do in life, more or less, but certainly we need to have higher profit than revenue growth. So that's what we mean with profitable growth, and that's what we aim for um, going forward as well. That's all I had. So, Jan, I'm sure you have lots of good questions, as you always do. And uh, Henrik, join me, please. Thank you, of course. Thank you. Thanks for a great <laughs> presentation. Um, yeah, we're on fire, as you can feel and, and see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, when I listen to the earnings calls of some of your peers, uh, for example, Nike, they mention right now that the market for uh, sports closing is uh, is uh, tr tremendously hot and it's uh, it's it's at a historically high level. Um, do you share this perception? And what could we expect in terms of growth looking forward? Uh, no, I think on, on so on one hand we. We also see there's a strong, you know, uh, underlaying, you know, general growth in sports and training. Uh, so we we see that as well. Um, and of course, looking at data as well, you know, sports distribution in Sweden is doing much better than fashion distribution. You know, e-commerce people that are focusing on sports are doing, you know, much better than fashion e-commerce players. So of course, uh, we anticipate that the whole idea bet between, you know, uh, behind training and sports will continue to be a growth drive also in the future. 
Uh, and we really saw that also, you know, really, you know, uh, enabling or, you know, growing really, really quick uh, during the pandemic as well. So it's clear that there was a lot of people thinking about, okay, how can I, you know, feel better? And if you start thinking about that, then of course, very, you know, very soon you will start thinking about, okay, you know, moving more or training more. I think the difference that we would want to do in versus Nike and Adidas is uh, we don't really believe that the world needs more performance brands. I think there's enough. Um, uh, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, reminding us that everything is possible and that you indeed can become the best tennis player in the world, all that kind of stuff. But I think what we would want to do instead in a world that is really very, very polarized, so we see that there's a few people training more, living longer, feeling better, and then there's a lot of people training less, living shorter, and not feeling so good. And I think we would want to reach out to those guys, those people, saying that you shouldn't train because of the performance that it will give you. You shouldn't train to uh, sign up for a running event um, you should simply train because that will make you feel better. So I think we will be the only, I think, sports brand that is building a brand proposition based on train to become better at something else. You know, use training as a way of, you know, enabling you to reach further with whatever you want to reach further at. So that's the whole idea. Um, we also see, you know, strong growth numbers. But of course, um, uh, with the high focus that we had during 2021, of course, also 2020, on profit, I think we're, we're currently, you know, and we will continue to uh, focus more on profitable growth than growth only, uh, as opposed to perhaps, you know, some of our peers that is focusing much more on growth. Um, so for us, it's really about, you know, adding profit at a quicker pace than the growth that we can add, uh, simply because we believe that what we are doing will take a bit of time. Uh, but uh, if we run too quick, then it will be easily be washed away. So it's really about building something solid uh, based on the idea uh, that we want to inspire people to train more. Mm. And you mentioned the profitability. And of course, we saw last year that you, uh, that you display uh, strong, um, uh, strong flexibility in terms of adjusting costs to maintaining margins. Do you still believe that you have this flexibility? Uh, do you still believe that you can adapt uh, your, your OPEX, for example, to, to maintain profitability levels? Um, no, I think absolutely. I think the beauty, of course, of being, you know, a small company with uh, with great ambitions uh, is as opposed to, of course, you know, me spending six years at Adidas, uh, uh, everything is just slower. And of course, it's harder. Um, whilst, of course, you know, we are quick to decisions. Um, you know, I remember us having our first, you know, COVID, you know, pandemic meeting um, in the beginning of March. Um, we announced, you know, uh, closing down the offices, you know, three days later. Uh, we immediately, of course, you know, cut down on costs. Um, uh, so I think we're, we're extremely quick, yes, but partly because we're small. Uh, and I think also what we see in, as predominantly Stockholm, actually, there's a number of other D2C brands that are running, you know, a very tight team, so a lean operation, not many people, but doing a massive amount of, of um, turnover. And of course, the fewer you are, the, the quicker you will get um, so I think there's definitely room for us to continue to be quick, but also, of course, to adjust our cost base depending on what's happening. Because again, as I've said, you know, uh, earlier, if, if the COVID at least, you know, taught me something, it is that it's, you know, trying to predict, you know, what tomorrow will bring is going to be very hard. So, it's, you know, it's never been harder to forecast. But, but I think uh, the stuff that remains relevant is that invest into your team, make sure you create a fantastic workplace. And then, of course, that will enable you to create fantastic results, independent of what happens around you. Mm. And you mentioned, uh, speaking on the underlying markets, that in Sweden there has been this uh, great conversion from bricks and mortar to online. Uh, could you elaborate a bit in broader terms on the underlying markets in other segments uh, or other markets uh, globally? Are there any particular markets that you perceive to be mature and others where you see growth potential? Uh, no, well, I think from... Uh, I think in terms of the, the transformation, it, it looks very similar uh, as what we saw. So there is an online growth going on in all European markets. Uh, perhaps a bit of an exception with Finland seems to be a bit slower uh, in terms of you know, transforming from brick and mortar to e-commerce. But, but for the most part, we see similar trends. Um, with regards to our approach, we, I think we really said that you know, we want to dig where we stand. So of course, the focus is Northern Europe. Uh, and you know, in terms of category, of course, there's still massive you know, potential in, in sports apparel. We're still number one in underwear, both in terms of awareness, in terms of preference, and in terms of volume uh, in Northern Europe. However, of course, you know, sports apparel, we're you know, a very small player. Uh, we do a fraction of what others do only in Nordic. Uh, so, of course, that's where we see the growth potential. However, I think also with you know, the online push and own e-com, 
we see that you know there's a much more flexible and agile um, uh, you know rollout possibility these days. So you can you know quickly open up a Spanish you know Bjornboy.com. You need to have it in local language. You might need to have a local warehouse to have the quick you know. Re uh, replenishment, uh, but of course that we are looking into. So the plan is really to open up more, you know, localized markets with our with our own ecom, and of course also utilizing the massive power that Amazon, for example, is having uh, in uh, in predominantly US, US, of course, but also in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to I want to make sure that we get some traction also in markets outside where we're sort of currently are having a very strong foothold. Um, uh, and you mentioned there in part of your online sales, the marketplace segment. Uh, could you explain what this is and uh, what's to expect from it going forward? Uh, absolutely. So there's a, a, a number of different ones popping up. Uh, we have a very, very strong partnership with Bold.com. So that's the biggest marketplace in Netherlands. Uh, our current uh, managing director uh, working for us, uh, we recruited from um, Bold.com because we simply you know, felt that... Uh, the marketplace potential um, is uh, is huge, uh, and we need to uh, increase just our knowledge and our competence around that. So uh, he's helping us, you know, to shape a, a new marketplace attack. We also managed to recruit um, a girl from uh, from Amazon China. She's been working for Amazon for ten years. She just started in January, and those two are working on a on a very very aggressive, you know, marketplace rollout. Um, and in a nutshell, of course, you know, there's two different opportunities with marketplaces. You could be a seller. Or you can be a vendor. You know, if you have the seller approach, you pretty much use the marketplace um, uh, as as a way of having traffic. But you own the stock. You know, uh, you merchandise. You set the prices. You do pretty much everything that you want to do. Uh, you can also then choose whether you want to use the marketplace. You know, ability to do replenishment, and that's the, our approach with Amazon, for example. Uh, or you can use them as a vendor, which then means that there's a traditional wholesale model where they so sort of come and see you, and then they buy stuff and they do whatever they want. Um, we we believe you know much more in the seller approach, so it's really to you know use the marketplace because they have a massive amount of traffic, and then make sure that we are present there uh, with the right products, you know, with the right price points, you know, with the right you know marketing campaigns. Um, so I think looking ahead, the biggest potential in terms of our brand is clearly our own ecom, uh, and then marketplaces. You know, that's where we can expect in in ratios the biggest growth. Um, and of course, you know, currently, you know, looking into um, Amazon US, which is a fantastic opportunity for us, uh, uh, knowing, of course, that the brand in the US, it is already quite strong without us actually doing anything. Much thanks, to, of course, to the legendary, the iconic tennis player Bjorn Boy. Uh, so as opposed to some of the other uh, D2C brands uh, that are working really well in Sweden and perhaps in Germany, you know, their brand name is completely unknown if they go to Japan or if they go to US, uh, but, you know, but try it out on your next vacation. Uh, go wherever you want in the world, and then you tell them Bjorn Boy, and they've heard about that, and and that costs a lot of money, and we have that already. So of course for us it's really about utilizing that, capitalizing on that you know well-known brand image. So whether it's currently it's known for a tennis player in in the Far East, we need to reshift that into sports, sports training, and of course our tennis collection. Mm. And you've spoken on your marketing strategy. Could you elaborate a bit on how this strategy changes while your sales converts to an online uh, sales? Um, well, I think the the, um, the biggest change um, uh, is, I think, partly in terms of the idea of us telling the story versus someone else telling the story. Uh, so I think we reshaped our entire marketing department just a year and a half ago. Uh, so they're much, they're much younger. They're much more agile. You know, they come from a, you know, from a different background than what uh, myself is coming from. And of course, they see it from a very different perspective. So I think the first you know, lesson for us is really that you need to have other people telling your story uh, because people will listen much more to that. And we see that now from data as well. You know, 92% listen to an influencer rather than a brand. Uh, so I think that that was a strong key learning. And then, of course, it's really about reshifting and then using those influencers, but also understand that there are individuals, so they're good at different things. So we have people that are really, really good at creating content. You know, they're like creative directors, so they create content we could use. There are others that are exceptionally good at selling. So they're really, you know, working as sales agents, if you will. You know, they're pushing, you know, volumes. And others are really good at driving traffic. So, of course, you need to, you know, talk to them and create a strong bond, um, understand what they could, you know, help you with. Uh, and I think what we're elaborating on right now is, of course, part of they will help our online business, but also how can we tie them into also our e-tailers and our marketplaces, uh, so I think that's going to be, you know, the, the next step in terms of evolving our, our communication. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Henrik and Jans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you, thank you for being here. Um, and have a, a fantastic next uh, Thursday. And uh, remember to work out today as well, as will you do tomorrow.
So thank you. <laughs> thank you.